Can everybody hear me now? Okay, that works a lot better. So who was at the party yesterday? Quick show of hands. Did you also make regrettable life choices? Okay, I'm not the only one. So this is a tough speaking slot because right now I'm the only thing that's between you and food. And if I learned something in my five years in Thailand is you don't want to get between people and their food. So I try to keep this short to the point and entertaining and I'll start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Michael. Generally, I'm known online as Citizen428. You can find me under that nickname on pretty much every coding or social network. Um, I've been based out of Bangkok, Thailand for the last five years. I'm the CTO of a software development company called Lockstep Labs. And I'm a, I feel a bit like the splitter here in the Monty Python reference, right? I'm the people's front of Judea um, because I'm mostly a Ruby developer. I've been doing Ruby since 2003, but I've always been Pi curious, and I like Python, but it's never been my main language. However, in the last couple of years, we're getting more and more project requests that either involve machine learning or data science, or as the talk today is about web scraping. So in the last three to four years, I did a lot more Python, and I generally like sharing what I learn as I go along. So as Dylan once told me, I actually ended up being the most frequent speaker at the monthly Thai Pai meetup, which is kind of ironic. So if you want to find me after the talk and discuss the relative merits of Ruby and Python and how they weigh up against each other, that's a conversation I like having. So please come and find me down at the lunch area. Also, um, I'm a co-organizer of this event, and I want to thank all of you for coming. But I also want to give a shout out to all the volunteers and people who make this possible. So maybe a quick round of applause for Dylan, the camera guy, and everybody else. Okay. So today we are talking about web scraping and spiders. This is probably the hardest part of my talk. Try finding an image of a cute spider. It took me forever. Um, so this is what we're going to cover today. I'll give a very quick introduction to web scraping. I will briefly talk about scraping in Python and available tools. I will explain why I chose Scrapey for our client project. Then we do a more hands-on walkthrough through some code. And then I'll try to talk about some common problems or some problems we encountered and the solutions we found for them. So what is scraping? Scraping generally breaks down into two parts. You have the web crawling, which means discovering links you're interested in and fetching those pages, and the actual scraping, which generally means taking unstructured or semi-unstructured data and turning it into some structured output format that you can work with and on. There's lots of use cases for this. The one people are probably most familiar with is web indexing, which is the first step to become a self-driving car company. Um, data mining. Price comparison websites. This is what we did for our clients, so this is what I'm going to talk about a bit. Um, change detection. Has a website changed significantly since I last visited it? Or data mashups. You bring in data from different websites and you turn it into something new. Um, there are some problems though with this. The danger zone. Um, as you can imagine, web scraping is a bit of a legal gray area depending on the country and jurisdiction you're in. You're working with data that you don't own and that you may not have rights to use. So there have been a couple of pretty high profile court cases. One of the first ones was eBay versus Bitter's Edge, which eBay won. So here the content creator won. Three years later, um, Intel lost the case, so suddenly the law flipped around. But then in 2009, Facebook won the scraping court case again. And ever since then, it has pretty much gone in the direction of the content provider, not the scraper. So the Facebook one in 2009 was a bit of a watershed moment. It's tough, right? So there are some anti-scraping measures that websites use, like um, bot detection frameworks, captures, not giving you access to certain parts of their site through the robots.txt file. Those are pretty strong hints that you're probably doing something they don't want you to do. So before you go off and build a business on data you don't own, make sure you talk through this with a lawyer. <laughs> this, I know it sounds like stupid advice, but it's really important because 
way too many people rush into projects, raise money, start building something, and then never go anywhere because they realize they were not allowed to use the data in the ways they believe. Just because something is online and publicly accessible does not mean you can just go and use it. It's a very common misconception. So on the general topic, on scraping in Python, there's a lot of choice for tools, right? You don't need Scrapy, it's not the only game in town. You can start simply, you use the requests library, you fetch some context, you work on it. You can use LXML to write your XPath selectors and drill down into your responses. You can do the same with CSS select and write different selectors. Or if you want to be the more full-fledged solution that is good at parsing not well from the HTML or something, you go and you use beautiful soup really more complex needs or you need to execute JavaScript, spoiler alert, we all do. Um, you can use Selenium with one of the different drivers like Phantom Jazz, for example. Up, on this, up to this point, um, Ruby had me covered, right? I could have done all of this in Ruby. Yeah, can you hear me better now? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so up, until, up to this point, Ruby had me completely covered, right? We have, we have decent requests libraries. We have no Gogiri that basically takes care of this. So why did I choose Scrapy even though I'm primarily a Ruby developer? Well, this is the reason. Scrapy is more than just a single tool. It is, this is the description from the website, right? It's a fast, high-level web crawling and scraping framework. So what does this mean? It's fast. This is a really important point for us. We were, we were scraping about a million pages across 10 different websites. You don't want to wait forever for that. So why is Scrapy fast? It uses the twisted, um, evented I.O. framework in the background. I guess Python people should be mostly familiar with that. Does anybody not know what twisted is? Okay. The next thing, uh, Scrapy is very high level. It, is, it has one task, right? It wants to be a comprehensive scraping framework. So whatever you need in a scraping framework, it's there. It has all the abstractions you're looking for. It allows you to go to a pretty high level, make your scrapers very declarative. You don't have to go down to the nitty gritty all the time. It covers both parts of the web scraping process, right? It has the crawlers that help you to find all the pages you're interested in by giving you a whole bunch of predefined crawler base classes that you can just use as is, for example, for crawling sitemap XML files, following RSS feeds. Or you can just use them as base classes and build your own for your specific use case. This is useful. Same for the scraping. It gives you a comprehensive DSL for adding XPaths or CSS selectors. And just using those, you don't have to reinvent this particular wheel. Also, it's a framework. It's a Scrapy describes itself as inspired by Django. I'd say this is true, right? This is not just a single tool. This is a set of tools. Scrapy gives you a crawler process that you can connect to with Telnet and you can check the progress if you have a spider that runs for five days. This is really interesting. It allows you to write middlewares for your scraping process that hook into the request and response cycle and let you transform the original response before you pass it on to the scraper gives you a pipelining process where each scraper can output into a, a series of pipeline steps that transform your data as you output it. Um, so this is what I mean. This is a complete solution for all your web scraping needs. If you need to scrape a single website, oh, by all means, go ahead and use requests and maybe beautiful soup, and you'll probably get good results, right? But for a project like we did, where we need to scrape 10 wildly different websites and extract millions of products for a price comparison website, Scrapy was really, really useful. On top of that, while it's an open source project, there is a commercial entity that is mostly comprised of Scrapy core developers, and they operate a website called Scraping Hub. Scraping Hub is a commercial Scrapy hosting as a service, so you can just who here is familiar with Heroku? You know Heroku? Yeah. So this is very similar. You deploy your scraping hub. You, you deploy your scrapey code to scraping hub with a simple git push. It will parse your scrapey settings.py, will set up the entire project, and give you a nice GUI to schedule, run, rerun, and inspect your, your scraping output. This is very nice. 
It also allows you to upload customized Docker images and run your spider inside a custom Docker image, which is really useful if maybe in later steps in your data transformation pipelines, you need certain tools that Scraping Hub does not provide out of the box. So this is really important. We actually deployed our code to Scraping Hub with a custom Docker image. So these are the concepts I'm going to cover now in the demo. We're going to briefly talk about spiders, and we see two of the Scrapey provided base classes, namely Spider and Crawl Spider. We're going to look at how Scrapey lets you write selectors in XPath CSS. Then we'll introduce the Scrapey concept of items and item loaders. I'll show you how you can clean your output or transform your output by using input and output processors that live outside your main spider code. So the two concerns of getting the content and operating on the content and cleaning it up are separated, which makes for a nice separation of concerns in your code base. And lastly, I'll show you a, unfortunately, fairly trivial pipeline example, because I unfortunately did not get permission to show you actual code from the client project. So this is horrible, unfortunately, sorry. So this is what we're going to do. The left-hand screenshot is the python.org jobs website, which is semi-unstructured data, like job descriptions in HTML divs. What we'll get out of it at the end is well-structured and well-defined JSON that did some transformations on the data. So let's see. Can you still hear me? So the first is you can not see this. Can you read this? You in the back, can you read this? Do you prefer a darker or a lighter scene? Lighter seam it is. Um, <laughs> so anyway, when, once you generate a new scraping project, this is what you get. Um, it generates a simple example directory structure for you, and this is the scraping settings. Actually, no, I do think you can switch to mirroring. You still see it in the back. Okay. Sorry for the spring break. So once you generate a new scrapey project, it will have created this following structure for you on the side, which is a directory where all your spider code's gonna live, some predefined files where your library code, like your item definition and middleware scope, um, and your settings pipeline. As you can see, here's an option regarding the DB gray area. Robots.txt.obey. If you want to be a good citizen on the web, you turn this on. If you maybe just want to use some data and you're not going to be public with it, you can choose to ignore it. Just be sure that you're explicitly violating the wishes of the website. Um, there's some other nice settings, like how many requests do you want to run in parallel. But 
then the most important settings while you actually work on your spiders is the HTTP cache. This basically makes a, lock, a local copy of every page you visit. So you don't repeatedly hit the same server over and over again while you write your XPath or CSS selects. It's really, really useful. A, your workflow and feedback cycle is much more streamlined. Plus, you, do, you don't put unnecessary um, stress on somebody else's systems. Also, you can do and you can go to conferences, talk about scrapers, and run them off your hard disk when the internet fails you. This is really nice. Spider. I copy the jobs because we're crawling. This is what Scrapey generates for you when you run Scrapey Gen Spider. It's called jobs because that's the name I gave it since we're crawling the jobs portion of the test. Plus the template and out. The next step, we would add some simple spider code. The first function. Parse. This is the crawling part, right? Can you read this still? I can make it one. Okay. So this is the crawling part, right? We say, oh, in this selector, we take each job block, which was each of those diffs. No, sorry. That's the next part. We are looking for, for jobs and response. Yeah. Sorry. We are looking for page links, right? And then we are yielding each of those URLs to scrape it. This is Twisted's async I.O., right? Generally, all methods in scraper classes finish, finish with yield, right? So we discover the next page links. We take the URLs out of their href attribute, and we yield it back to Scrapey. And Scrapey just, if you have middlewares, this is where it would run through your entire middleware stack. As you can see, we also define a callback. That's the parse jobs function here. This is where your request gets after it ran through the middleware stack. So now you can work on the actual response. So what are we doing here? We say, within the recent jobs list, take each job. Then we yield, basically just a basic Python dictionary, where we extract information with different um, CSS selectors. As you can see, you can do extract first, which would only give you the first element, or you can do extract, which by default will give you everything that matches a certain selector. This has one problem, though. It's a dictionary. There is no checking of the keys. So if you have 10 different spiders and you mistype title in one of them, you'll probably not find out before you try to, to work on your data. So the next thing that Scrapey provides that is really useful here is items. This looks a bit silly. An item is just a class that inherits from Scrapey item and lets you define the field set or basically the constructor arguments that you're expecting. This is a nice step up from the previous spider because now you cannot mistype an attribute anymore. If you try to generate, as you can see here, we're really calling the constructor for a job, right? If you misspell title now in one of your 10 spiders, you'll immediately get a Python error. This will not work, right? So this is a first level of abstraction that Scrapey provides you, it gives you a bit of type safety, or at least it makes sure that your data is all consistent and coherent. You can take this a step further and use what is called an item loader. Oops, sorry. An item loader just it takes away some of the manual work of using items. As you can see, we define an item loader. We say, which class do the different items does each of these items have right in our class jobs? Um, and it makes the spider a bit more declarative because the loader defines a more high-level interface where you say, on the loader instance, you have add CSS or add XPath or add regex. So you just tell your loader, look, you get this the job selector. What I want out is a job. Here the X passes to make it happen. Load item will actually execute this code and then yield your results. This by itself is not so useful, but it becomes in the next step um, when you define a dedicated loader. 
as I did here. So now we have a job loader, right? We take all of these job elements. The default item class is now set to job, so we can save us this part in the spider. We define a default output processor, and output processor is what do I get out of my loader, right? So at CSS, by default, uses an all extractor. So even if your expression only matches a single argument, it will be wrapped in an array of one element. So take first basically automatically unwraps all of those, right? It says, just take the first element. Then for company, we define different um, input and output processors, right? So this map compose lambda, this just strips the string, right? Because the markup there is not particularly clean. So we take the string and we strip it on input. On output, <laughs> we join it again with an empty string because the way that the selector worked, you may end up with several empty strings. One of them is always leading. This is very specific to this website. So we just join it. And then we also define the little helper method for the tags, which is defined here. And it basically just turns the, the descriptions like web development into lowercase underscore tags. Uh, I just did a function here inline, but the point was to show you that um, every input or output processor can be any Python callable, right? So it can be a Lambda, it can be a function, it can be a class that implements call, which is, for example, what you see in join, right? So join is a class that you can basically give a parameter to where you say, this is what I want to join with. And then it actually performs the action by being called as the class instance. Um, I like this. I like this a lot. Why? Because um, your job classes. This is still very declarative, right? This says, look at your markup. There's no logic in here, right? Like, um, you can basically get an intern to do this as long as they can use Chrome developer tools, <laughs> click on something and out the next pass expression to put here. This is a very easy task. It's declarative. You don't need to do much. You can have a better developer write your input and output processors. Or you, if you do this a lot, you will slowly build up your own library of tools for this process. That I have. I mean, I, for the last project, I wrote my own little you know utils library, and I had all the different cleanup steps well defined, and I could reuse them. But there's a way to make this even more declarative by using a different spider class. This is what Scrapey calls a crawl spider. As the name suggests, this is the spider you use when you have a website. You want to crawl all the relevant subpages and then yield their context, uh, their contents to parse jobs, right? This is basically automatically doing what we had previously defined, but once again, in a more declarative matter, right? So you have these link extractor helpers. What they do is they let you define rules. So you say, here I have a link extractor, and the rule is allow all links that point to something that matches the regular expression page equals. Scrapey does all the work for you now. It will go on the page, it will find all links that satisfy this predicate, and parse them into your callback method, which is still parse jobs. So now, your spider itself is pretty much logic free. It's just very declarative. It's very easy to write. All the difficult parts live in your item, your item loader, and your actual job class. So it's one last step. Pipelines. So like I said before, a pipeline, every crawled item after you're done with your spider will be passed to a pipeline. In the settings pie, you can define as many pipelines as you want, and they will be executed in the order they're defined in. So here, this is a very stupid, and, but it's an example, right? So this just takes your item 
and adds a called add timestamp that we calculate here on the spot. The actual use case I used it for is for this price comparison website. We were crawling products of 10 different uh, websites. Each of them had their own product categories, but our customer needed all of those products to be in their categories. So we essentially had a giant dictionary that was keyed first by website and then had the mapping of original websites category to clients category. And we did all of this here, which means it was one central place. We only had to do that once. All 10 spiders yielded into the same pipeline all the data that came out already had this done, the translation was done, so we could just go and import this data. So I quickly show you how Scrapey looks in action. I have three minutes left, it is not so good. Um, this is another nice thing, this makes a really nice development flow. Scrapey has an interactive shell, you can just load up a URL it will see which spider is responsible for that URL. And then, for example, you can look at the response. Oops. And it will open it in the web browser. And then you can just, you know, create your CSS selectors and all. Or if you want to run it, this is how you would do it. Um, JSON lines is an output format that Scrapey offers you. It's basically instead of making one giant JSON document, it will put every item as a separate JSON document, one per line. Since there's no good streaming JSON parsers for a lot of languages, this is more memory efficient because you can just read the file line by line, JSON parse each line and kick off the working instead of you know parsing a whole three gigabyte JSON file right away, waiting for that to finish. So this is Scrapey's um, preferred output format right now. And it looks like, yeah. This is how our data looks like, right? So we went from unstructured or semi-structured HTML to this in very few and very easy steps. Um, we could now add different Python-related job websites, do the same scraping there end up with the same data format and then maybe start our machine learning process, right? Like, how did Python jobs start? You could compare the tags and say, how do the tags or for the last three months compare to the tags over the last 12 months? Are there trends, are there tags we see less, tags we see more? Once you have data in a structured format, there's a lot of interesting things we can do with it, which I guess I don't have to tell you here at the Python conference. So. What are some common problems when you do web scraping? Well, one is JavaScript, because that's just JavaScript. It's always a problem. But the problem is also how modern websites are built, right? You know, we encountered some websites that when you receive the original DOM, it's effectively a single diff with the ID of app. And then, you know, some Angular app comes and mounts everything into there. Scrapey doesn't work like that. So you have to bring out the bigger guns. You either use Selenium, Scrapey itself has a, an engine called Splash that runs in a Docker image and will execute all the JavaScript for you. And you, uh, you communicate with it through a port. Or I wrote the custom middleware for our company that uses Chrome driver and a headless Chrome browser, executes all the JavaScript for you, and also passes the Selenium instance into your spider so you can click there if you want. Uh, captures, there are solutions for that. There are web services like eCapture, there's a website called Desk by Capture. Those are all services. But once again, keep in mind what you're doing may not be legal, right? If somebody puts in some effort that is supposed to stop you from using their data, this is up to you and your lawyers and your business to decide, right? But be mindful of it. Another thing, writing scrapers is really, really boring sometimes. So there are tools that semi-automate this process. Once again, Scraping Hub offers quite a nice tool that is called Portia, that uh, also runs through a Docker container. It lets you open a website, click on things, and annotate them, right? So you would click on the job title, for example, on the python.org website, and say, this is my job title. This line is gonna be what eventually becomes the tags. And then it will try to auto-write the spider for you. Um, the only problem I found with this is the selectors are too specific. So I find 
you need to strike a balance between CSS or XPath selectors that select what you need without being overly tied to the markup. It seems people change their markup a lot more than their CSS classes. So it's not unlikely that the diff becomes a span. They're not quite so likely to change um, their CSS classes. So it's a bit of a black art and there is no real best way to do it, but I found not overly specific selectors have a tendency of breaking a lot less than more specific selectors. Um, but still, Portia is a really, really good start, and then you can manually just like edit down the selectors. And generally, I mentioned this before, Scraping Hub, great deployment platform. You can either git push or use Docker. Um, there's also ScrapyD, that's a daemon that allows you to manage, run, and orchestrate Scrapy processes if you're hosting your own infrastructure or use a cloud provider like AWS. So it's a very professional tool and it has you covered in most scenarios. Uh, this is the Scraping Hub website. I'm not affiliated by any way. This is not meant as an advertisement. I just had a really good time using it. This is Portia. As you can see, you annotate certain parts of the website. And this is it. I'm done.